Britain's Ida. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Britain's Ida, attributed to Edmund Spencer. Actually, however, a poem called Venus and Anchises, written by Phineas Fletcher. Note by the editor. We are unwilling to exclude anything that has ever been imputed to Spencer, and although we are convinced with T. Wharton, observe on F.Q., Volume 1, page 123, edit 1762, that Spencer was not the author of Britain's Ida, as it is short and possesses considerable merit of its own, we insert it. The reader will thus be able to form his own opinion. T. Walkley, who first printed it in Duodecimo in 1628, only tells us that he was, quote, certainly assured, unquote, that, quote, it must be a work of Spencer's, unquote. But he furnishes no evidence beyond what is merely internal, unless we also take into account the assertion of the writer of the not ungraceful preliminary verses, quote, tis learned Spencer's muse, unquote. It has a much more modern air than anything else Spencer has left behind him, and we do not believe that it was produced at the earliest until near the close of the reign of James I. In stanza 11 of Canto 3, the author speaks of his, quote, newborn quill, unquote. The poem is not even an imitation of Spencer, nor, as far as we can judge, was it intended to be so. Canto 1. The Argument. The youthly shepherds, wanting here, and beauties rare displayed, appear. What exercise he chief affects, his name and scornful love neglects. In Ida Vale, who knows not Ida Vale, when harmless Troy yet felt not Grecian spite, an hundred shepherds wand, and in the dale, while their fair flocks the three-leaved pastures bite, the shepherds' boys with hundred sportings like gave wings under the times too speedy haste. Ah, foolish lads that strove with lavish waste so fast to spend the time that spends your time as fast. Among the rest, that all the rest excelled, a dainty boy there wand, whose harmless years now in their freshest budding gently swelled. His nymph-like face ne'er felt the nimble shears, Youth's downy blossom through his cheek appears. His lovely limbs, but love he quite discarded, were made for play, but he no play regarded, and fit love to reward, and with love be rewarded. High was his forehead, arched with silver mould, where never anger churlish wrinkle dighted. His auburn locks hung like dark threads of gold that wanton airs, with their fair length incited, to play among their wanted curls, delighted. His smiling eyes with simple truth were stored. Ah, how should truth in those thief eyes be stored, which thousand loves had stolen, and never one restored? His lily cheek might seem an ivory plain, more purely white than frozen apennine, where lovely bashfulness did sweetly reign, in blushing scarlet clothed and purple fine, a hundred hearts had this delightful shrine, still cold itself, inflamed with hot desire, that well the face might seem in divers tire to be a burning snow, or else a freezing fire. His cheerful looks and merry face would prove, if eyes the index be where thoughts are read, a dainty playful of for naked love. Of all the other parts, enough is said that they were fit twins for so fair a head. Thousand boys for him, thousand maidens died. Die they that list, for such his rigorous pride, he thousand boys, ah, fool, and thousand maids denied. His joy was not in music, sweet delight, though well his hand had learnt that cunning art, or dainty songs to daintier ears indite, but through the plains to chase the nimble heart with well-tuned hounds, or with his certain dart the tusked boar or savage bear to wound. Meantime his heart with monsters doth abound. A ah, fool to seek so far what nearer might be found. His name, well known unto those woody shades where unrewarded lovers oft complain them, Anchises was. Anchises! Off the glades and mountains heard, Anchises had disdained them. 
not all their love one gentle look had gained them that rocky hills with echoing noise consenting and Kaisis plained but he no whit relenting harder than rocky hills laughed at their vain lamenting canto two the argument Dian's garden of delight with wonder holds Anchises' sight, while from the bower such music sounds as all his senses near confounds. One day it chanced, as he the deer pursued, tired with sport and faint with weary play, fair Venus' grove not far away he viewed, whose trembling leaves invite him there to stay, and in their shades his sweating limbs display. There in the cooling glade he softly paces, and much delighted with their even spaces, what in himself he scorned, he praised their kind embraces. The wood with Paphian myrtles peopled, whose springing youth felt never winter's spiting, to laurels sweet were sweetly married, doubling their pleasing smells in their uniting, when single much, much more when mixed delighting, no foot of beast durst touch this hallowed place, and many a boy that longed the woods to trace entered with fear, but soon turned back his frighted face. The thick-locked boughs shut out the tell-tale sun, for Venus hated his all-blabbing light, since her known fall, which oft she wished undone, and scattered rays did make a doubtful sight, like to the first of day or last of night, the fittest light for lovers' gentle play. Such light best shows the wandering lover's way, And guides his erring hand. Night is love's holiday. So far in this sweet labyrinth he strayed, That now he views the garden of delight, Whose breast, with thousand painted flowers arrayed, With diverse joy captived his wandering sight. But soon the eyes rendered the ears their right. For such strange harmony he seemed to hear that all his senses flocked into his ear, and every faculty wished to be seated there. From a close bower this dainty music flowed, a bower apparelled round with divers roses, both red and white, which by their liveries showed their mistress fair, that there herself reposes, seemed that would strive with those rare music closes by spreading their fair bosoms to the light, which the distracted sense should most delight. That wraps the melted ear, this both the smell and sight. The boy, twixt fearful hope and wishing fear, crept all along, for much he longed to see the bower, much more the guest so lodged there, and as he goes he marks how well agree nature and art in discord unity, each striving who should best perform his part. Yet art now helping nature, nature art. While from his ears a voice thus stole his heart. Fond men, whose wretched care the life soon ending, By striving to increase your joy, to spend it, And spending joy, yet find no joy in spending, You hurt your life by striving to amend it, And seeking to prolong it, soonest end it. Then while fit time affords thee time and leisure, Enjoy while yet thou mayst thy life's sweet pleasure. Too foolish is the man that starves to feed his treasure. Love is life's end, an end but never ending, All joys, all sweets, all happiness awarding. Love is life's wealth, ne'er spent but ever spending, More rich by giving, taking by discarding. Love's life's reward, rewarded in rewarding. Then from thy wretched heart, fond care remove. Ah, shouldst thou live but once love's sweets to prove, Thou wilt not love to live, unless thou live to love. To this sweet voice a dainty music fitted its well-tuned strings, And to her notes consorted, and while with skilful voice the song she ditted, the blabbing echo had her words retorted, that now the boy beyond his soul transported through all his limbs feels run a pleasant shaking, and, twixt a hope and fear, suspects mistaking, and doubts he sleeping dreams, and broad awake fears waking. Canto three: The Argument 
Fair Cytheria's limbs beheld, the straying lad's heart so enthralled, that in a trance his melted sprite leaves the senses slumbering in delight. Now to the bower he sent his thievish eyes to steal a happy sight. There do they find fair Venus, that within half-naked lies, and straight amazed, so glorious beauty shined, would not return the message to the mind, but, full of fear and superstitious awe, could not retire or back their beams withdraw, so fixed on too much seeing, made they nothing saw. Her goodly length stretched on a lily bed, a bright foil of a beauty far more bright. Few roses round about were scattered, as if the lilies learned to blush for spite to see a skin much more than lily-white. The bed sank with delight so to be pressed, and knew not which to think a chance more blessed, both blessed, so to kiss, and so again be kissed. Her spacious forehead, like the clearest moon whose full-grown orb begins now to be spent, largely displayed in native silver shone, giving wide room to beauty's regiment, which on the plain with love triumphing went, her golden hair, a rope of pearl embraced, which, with their dainty threads oft times enlaced, made the eye think the pearl was there in gold enchased. Her full, large eye in jetty black arrayed, proved beauty not confined to red and white, but oft herself in black more rich displayed. Both contraries did yet themselves unite, to make one beauty and different delight. A thousand loves sate playing in each eye, and smiling mirth kissing fair courtesy, by sweet persuasion when a bloodless victory. The whitest white set by her silver cheek grew pale and wan, like unto heavy lead. The freshest purple, Fresher dyes must seek that dares compare with them his fainting red. On these Cupido winged armies led of little loves that with bold wanton train under those colours marching on the plain force every heart and to low vassalage constrain. Her lips, most happy each in others' kisses, from their so wished embracement seldom parted, yet seemed to blush at such their wanton blisses. But when sweet words their joining sweet disparted, To the ear a dainty music they imparted, Upon them fitly sat delightful smiling, A thousand souls with pleasing stealth beguiling. Ah, that such shows of joy should be all joys exiling! The breath came slowly thence, Unwilling leaving so sweet a lodge, But when she once intended to feast the air with words, the heart deceiving, more fast it thronged so to be expended, and at each word a hundred loves attended, playing the breath more sweet than is that firing where that Arabian only bird expiring lives by her death, by loss of breath more fresh respiring. Her chin, like to a stone in gold enchased, seemed a fair jewel wrought with cunning hand, and, being double, doubly the face graced. This goodly frame on her round neck did stand, such pillar well such curious work sustained, and on his top the heavenly sphere uprearing might well present, the daintier appearing, a less but better atlas that their heaven bearing. Lower, Two breasts stand all their beauties bearing, Two breasts as smooth and soft, But, ah, oh, alas, their smoothest softness Far exceeds comparing. More smooth and soft, but not that ever was Where they are first deserves the second place. Yet each as soft and each as smooth as other, And when thou first triest one and then the other, each softer seems than each, and each than each seems smoother. Lowly, between their dainty hemispheres, their hemispheres the heavenly globes excelling, a path more white than is the name it bears, the lacteal path 
conducts to the sweet dwelling where best delight all joys sits freely dealing where hundred sweets and still fresh joys attending receive in giving and still love despending grow richer by their loss and wealthy by expending but stay bold shepherd here thy footing stay nor trust too much unto thy new-born quill as farther to those dainty limbs to stray or hope to paint that vale or beauteous hill which past the finest hand or choicest skill but were thy verse and song as finely framed as are those parts yet should it soon be blamed for now the shameless world of best things is ashamed that cunning artist that old greece admired thus far his venus fitly portrayed but there he left nor farther e'er aspired his daedal hand that nature perfected by art felt art by nature limited ah well he knew though his fit hand could give breath to dead colours teaching marble live yet would these lively parts his hand of skill deprive such when this gentle boy her closely viewed only with thinnest silken veil or laid whose snowy colour much more snowy shewed by being next that skin and all betrayed which best in naked beauties are arrayed his spirits melted with so glorious sight ran from their work to see so splendid light and left the fainting limbs sweet slumbering into light note on two breasts as smooth and soft ought we not here to read as smooth as soft just above bearing b e a r n g means bearing b a r i n g c Canto four, the argument. The swounding swain recovered is by the goddess, his soul rapting bliss, their mutual conference, and how her service she doth him allow. Soft sleeping Venus, wakened with the fall, looking behind, the sinking boy espies, with all she starts, and wondereth with all she thinks that there her fair Adonis dies and more she thinks the more the boy she eyes so stepping nearer up begins to rear him and now with love himself she will confer him and now before her love himself she will prefer him the lad soon with that dainty touch revived feeling himself so well so sweetly seated begins to doubt whether he yet here lived or else his flitting soul to heaven translated was there in starry throne and bliss and stated oft would he die so to be often saved and now with happy wish he closely craved for ever to be dead to be so sweet and graved the paphian princess in whose lovely breasts spiteful disdain could never find a place when now she saw him from his fit released to juno leaving wrath and scolding base comforts the trembling boy with smiling grace but oh those smiles too full of sweet delight surfeit his heart full of the former sight so seeking to revive more wounds his feeble sprite tell me fair boy said she what erring chance hither directed thy unwary pace for sure contempt or pride durst not advance their foul aspect in thy so pleasant face tell me what brought thee to this hidden place or lack of love or mutual answering fire or hindered by ill chance in thy desire tell me what is thy fair and wishing eyes require the boy who since was never yet acquainted with such a music stood with ears erected and sweetly with that pleasant spell enchanted more of those sugared strains long time expected till seeing she his speeches not rejected first sighs arising from his heart's low centre thus can reply when each word bold would vent her and strive the first that dainty labyrinth to enter fair cyprian queen for well that heavenly face proves thee the mother of all conquering love pardon i pray thee my unweeting pace 
for no presumptuous thoughts did hither move my daring feet to this thy holy grove but luckless chance which if you not gainsay i still must rue hath caused me here to stray and lose myself alas in losing of my way nor did i come to right my wronged fire never till now i saw what ought beloved and now i see but never dare aspire to move my hope where yet my love is moved whence though i would why would it not remove it only since i have placed my love so high which sure thou must or sure thou wilt deny grant me yet still to louve though in my loot to die but she that in his eyes love's face would seen and flaming heart did not such suit disdain for cruelty fits not sweet beauty's queen but gently could his passion entertain though she love's princess he a lowly swain first to his bold intrusion she acquits him then to her service happy boy admits him and like another love with bow and quiver fits him and now with all the loves he grew acquainted and cupid's self with his like face delighted taught him a hundred ways with which he daunted the prouder hearts and wronged lovers righted forcing to love the most his love despited and now the practic boy did so approve him and with such grace and cunning art did move him that all the pretty loves and all the graces move him canto five the argument the lover's sad despairing plaints bright venus with his love acquaints sweetly importuned he doth show from whom proceedeth this his woe yet never durst his faint and coward heart ah fool faint heart fair lady ne'er could win assail fair venus with his new learnt art but kept his love and burning flame within which more flamed out the more he pressed it in and thinking oft how just she might disdain him while some cool myrtle shade did entertain him thus sighing would he sit and sadly would he plain him ah fond and hapless boy nor know i whether more fond or hapless more that all so high hast placed thy heart where love and fate together may never hope to end thy misery nor yet thyself dare wish a remedy all hindrances alas conspire to let it ah fond and hapless boy if canst not get it in thinking to forget at length learn to forget it ah far too fond but much more hapless swain seeing thy love can be forgotten never serve and observe thy love with willing pain and though in vain thy love thou dost persever yet all in vain do thou adore her ever no hope can crown thy thoughts so far aspiring nor dares thyself desire thine own desiring yet live thou in her love and die in her admiring thus oft the hopeless boy complaining lies but she that well could guess his sad lamenting who can conceal love from love's mother's eyes did not disdain to give his love contenting cruel the soul that feeds on souls tormenting nor did she scorn him though not nobly born love is nobility nor could she scorn that with so noble skill her title did adorn one day it chanced thrice happy day and chance while loves were with the graces sweetly sporting and to fresh music sounding play and dance and cupid's self with shepherd's boys consorting laughed at their pretty sport and simple courting fair venus seats the fearful boy close by her where never phoebus jealous looks might eye her and bids the boy his mistress and her name descry her long time the youth bound up in silence stood while hope and fear with hundred thoughts begun fit prologue to his speech and fearful blood from heart and face with these post tidings run that either now he's made or now undone at length his trembling words with fear made weak began his too long silence thus to break while from his humble eyes first reverence seemed to speak fair queen of love my life thou mayst command too slender price for all thy former grace which i receive at thy so bounteous hand but never dare i speak her name and face 
my life is much less prized than her disgrace, and, for I know if I her name relate, I purchase anger, I must hide her state, unless thou swear, by sticks I purchase not her hate. Fair Venus well perceived his subtle drift, and, swearing gentle patience, gently smiled, while thus the boy pursued his former drift. No tongue was ever yet so sweetly skilled, nor greatest orator so highly styled, though helped with all the choicest art's direction. But when he durst describe her heaven's perfection by his imperfect praise, dispraised his imperfection. Her form is, as herself, perfect celestial. No mortal spot her heavenly frame disgraces. Beyond compare, such nothing is terrestrial, more sweet than thought or powerful wish embraces, the map of heaven, the sum of all her graces. But if you wish more truly limbed to eye her than fainting speech or words can well descry her, look in a glass, and there more perfect you may spy her. Canto six: The Argument The Boy's Short Wish her larger grand, that doth his soul with bliss enchant, whereof, impatient, uttering all, enraged Job contrives his thrall. Thy crafty art, replied the smiling queen, hath well my chiding on rage prevented, yet mightst thou think that yet twas never seen that angry rage and gentle love consented. But if to me thy true love is presented, what wages for thy service must I owe thee? For by the selfsame vow I hear about thee, whatever thou require, I frankly will allow thee. Pardon, replies the boy, for so affecting beyond mortality, and not discarding thy service, was much more than my expecting. But if thou, more than bountyhood regarding, wilt needs heap up reward upon rewarding, thy love I dare not ask, or mutual firing. One kiss is all my love and pride's aspiring, and after starve my heart for my too much desiring. Fond boy, said she, too fond that asked no more, thy want, thy taking, is no whit decreased, and giving spends not our increasing store. Thus, with a kiss, his lips she sweetly pressed. Most blessed kiss, but hope more than most blessed. The boy did think heaven fell while thus he joyed, and while joy he so greedily enjoyed, he felt not half his joy by being overjoyed. Why, sighst, fair boy, said she, dost thou repent thee thy narrow wish in such straight bonds to stay? Well may I sigh, said he, and well lament me, that never such a debt may hope to pay. A kiss, said she, a kiss will back repay. Wilt thou, replied the boy, too much delighted, content thee with such pay to be requited? She grants, and he his lips, heart, soul, to payment cited. Look, as a ward, long from his lands detained, and subject to his guardian's cruel law, now spends the more, the more he was restrained, so he, yet though in laying out his store he doubly takes, yet finds himself grow poor. With that he marks and tells her out a score, and doubles them, and trebles all before. Fond boy, the more thou pays, thy debt still grows the more. At length, whether these favours so had fired him with kindly heat, inflaming his desiring, or whether those sweet kisses had inspired him, he thinks that something wants for his requiring, and still aspires, yet knows not his aspiring. But yet, though that he knoweth, so she gave that he presents himself her bounden slave, still his more wishing face seemed somewhat else to crave and boldened with success and many graces, his hand, chained up in fear, he now released, and, asking leave, couraged with her embraces, again it prisoned in her tender breast. Ah, blessed prison, prisoners too much blessed, 
There with those sisters long time doth he play, And now full boldly enters love's highway, While down the pleasant vale his creeping hand doth stray. She, not displeased with this his wanton play, Hiding his blushing with a sugared kiss, With such sweet heat his rudeness doth allay, That now he perfect knows whatever bliss Elder love taught, and he before did miss that mote with joy in such untried joys trying he gladly dies and death new life applying gladly again he dies that oft he may be dying long thus he lived slumbering in sweet delight free from sad care and fickle world's annoy bathing in liquid joys his melted sprite and longer mock but he Ah, oh, foolish boy, too proud and too impatient of his joy, To woods and heaven and earth his bliss imparted, That Jove upon him down his thunder darted, Blasting his splendid face, and all his beauty swarted. Such be his chance that to his love doth wrong, Unworthy he to have so worthy place, That cannot hold his peace and blabbing tongue. Light joys float on his lips, but rightly grace sinks deep, and the heart's low centre doth embrace. Might I enjoy my love till I unfold it, I'd lose all favours when I blabbing told it. He is not fit for love that is not fit to hold it. Note and and not rage, perhaps hot rage. Below, Todd read fixing for firing, probably only a misprint. See. Note on that to his love doth wrong. No emendation is necessary, but possibly the poet, whoever he might be, wrote that so his love doth wrong. Three lines lower, rightly, reads like an error of the press, but we know not how to correct it. See. End of Britain's Ida, attributed to Edmund Spencer. Recording by Thomas Copeland.